I want to use this picture of the world splitting in two as a picture of reality and this will help us get into the topic of a new genre of literature. Now, a rough picture of reality could be conceived of as having a surface aspect and a background aspect. Now, the surface aspect of reality is what we normally see through the senses, as often called the phenomenal world. And the background aspect of reality is the hidden, the invisible. It's, the, it's what supports the surface reality. And I want to give you some examples of the relationship between the two, the relationship between the surface of reality and the background reality background of reality and how they change over time. So to start off with, I want to give you an example from my own life. This book, which I'm showing you the cover here, Living in, Un in Uncertainty, Living with Spirit, is a book of essays in which I describe uh, some actual experiences I've had where the, the surface of reality has been penetrated or punctuated by the background and by my paying attention to it in a certain way my life was altered accordingly. But this, the story I want to tell you uh, comes out of this book uh, concerns a peacock. Now on this particular day, uh, this is in the early 1990s, uh, I was summarily fired uh, from my job. I was working as a contract counsellor and I was doing sand tray. <laughs> And uh, I learned to my horror at the time that I had just been fired and I was to leave that day. There was no explanation, uh, but I had to pack my things quickly and then go to the administrative office, which was a large house uh, with a huge conference room. And uh, I was led in to sit at this conference table with 20 chairs. Uh, I sat in the middle and this man walked in, I don't, don't know who he was, and sat at the end of the table and we had 18 or so chairs empty. So in this big old empty room, he had an envelope full of notes uh, for my severance pay. He, he shoved it across to me and then got up to walk away. Well, I was stunned. I was anxious. Uh, I had no idea why I was being fired, and I started to get very angry at, at his uh, uh, administrative uh, technique, you might say. So I asked him uh, why was I fired, and of course he gave the usual administrative babble. Uh, we're cutting back on staff, we have financial difficulties, and, and so on and so forth. None of which was true, it was just all lies. So I found myself getting very angry. Now, at the moment that I was about to give him an angry outburst, I looked through the door and peered out into this beautiful English garden, and to my utter surprise, this peacock strolled by very calmly and I was for some reason that moment penetrated my anger and the anger disappeared and I found myself just looking at this peacock. I said to the administrator do you get many peacocks around here and he said oh yes we have quite a few and uh, when they scream they remind us of screaming children. So I took that in my moment had my anger had completely evaporated in that moment, and so I shook his hand. He he was no longer of any interest to me. Actually, I I knew that uh, something had happened and that our ways were going to part. So I shook his hand and left. And it was only afterwards, when I began to unpack what had happened, that I realised that the peacock, the appearance of that peacock, was was the appearance of a call to another way of life altogether, a life where, which led me away from the world in which this man lived, the world of screaming children, uh, into another world al altogether, another kind of work way of working with people, another kind of career altogether. Whereas for him it was just, a, just a, a, another example of a screaming child, for me the peacock was the hint of something new, the hint of a possible future that I listened to and stepped into and uh, uh, walked into a, a, a new life. 
I, I wasn't able to understand it until many years later, but I go into that in, in the book uh, along with my other essays. So that's an example of where the background protruded or penetrated the surface of life. It wasn't the peacock, empirically you might say, it was, it was what the peacock stood for, its symbolic value, which only I got at that time. Uh, by seeing it symbolically, I penetrated to the background and got a hint of something coming towards me out of the unknown future and I decided to pay attention and answer it. So that's that's an example of, of the relationship between the surface of life and the background of life, or reality. I want to give you two more examples, historical examples. Now, one of the things that I have studied for many years is how consciousness and the world change over time, calling this for short the evolution of consciousness. Our present structure of reality, which I pictured by the world splitting in two, a point I'll get back to later, wasn't always so. Uh, there was always a surface of reality and a background, but their relationship was uh, much softer, much more transparent. One could move from one to the other much more gently. Uh, we wouldn't use the word penetrate or punctuate as I did in my in my example. Now let me take you back. Uh, we can, it, in history, we can reconstruct the former con- forms of consciousness and the world in which we lived. Uh, there, there is a method for doing this, and some people are very, very good at it. One such person is Nikolai T- Tolstoy, and here is the book I'll be reading from. It's a book, uh, The Return of the King, and he was a Celtic scholar, and uh, he uh, tells the story of Merlin, and in this one particular example, which I will quote, uh, this is the story of Merlin and his uh, the wonderful magical world of the Celts. And it it also is a world that has long gone for us. But this is, quote, is how Merlin entered the background of rea- the background aspect of reality from the surface. He's climbing up the hill. It's it's falling evening, and he's with Rufinus, the Roman tribune, who was his friend. And now I'll I'll read the story. The air was raw and chilly and cold had arisen upon a wind blowing the full length of the world from the hard, unyielding planets, set in the void. The rough shoulder of the hill against which I leaned felt icy cold, and icy cold was I becoming myself. Rufinus was speaking, but as I felt the draw and the power of the hill exerted upon me, his words became fainter and more distant. Other sounds were breaking in. A night jar, twisting silently in the sky above us, uttered uttered a guttural chur-chur. Like the Tribune, he was newly come from Africa, and like the Tribune, his voice was harsh and broken. From all about me on the heather, the rocks, there came a rustling and a squeaking and a grunting. The cold had become more bitter, cold, cold, cold. I felt as if I were frozen into the hard ground. The owl's discordant shriek heralded the rising of a night mist. I did not doubt that it was the mist of Gwyn Mabnud. I was wedged in the belly of the hill, my body stiff and cold, and before me, cross-legged upon a mound, sat a huge skin-clad herdsman. Beside him, a curly-haired mastiff, bigger than a stallion of nine winters. Its breath was such that it would consume dead wood and yellowed tufts of grass upon the open plains. In his hand, the great swart figure bore an iron club that would be a burden for two men to carry. Now here you can feel a seamless transition from ordinary surface reality to the background, to the mythic world that supports and gives form to our phenomenal world. Merlin wasn't penetrated or punctuated by the background as as I was in my example. 
he just lay back and surrendered and one world gradually merged and gave rise to the other. Now this this uh, kind of reality uh, is recorded well in as far, at least as far back as Parmenides, uh, who had a method of incubation uh, called the at- Iatromantis, and that's basically all that it involves. One would just collapse on the ground, give up, surrender, and that's all that was needed to slip from this world into the other world, uh, where one could receive uh, messages to bring back. That world has gradually gone and been replaced by our world and a piece of literature that beautifully shows the transition point psychologically is Cervantes' Don Quixote and here are some pictures from Gustave Doré. Now Don Quixote was a a knight called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. And he set off on adventures in a world that he shared with no one else. Even his servant, Sancho, was no longer in the world that he was, the same world as Merlin. So he goes, as we well know, tilting at windmills, thinking that they're monsters. For him, indeed, they are monsters. The windmills, like the cold icy slope, for Merlin just gave way and he saw the monsters. However, that wasn't shared by Sancho or anybody else in the drama. He uh, was alone with that vision and uh, the story shows how it gradually gave way to what we now call empirical reality or philosophically the positive universe. So here's the story. At this point they came in sight of 30 or 40 windmills And as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Fortune is arranging matters for us better than we could have shaped our desires ourselves. For look there, friend Sancho, where thirty or more monstrous giants present themselves, all of whom I mean to engage in battle and slay. And with spoils we shall begin to make our fortunes, for this is righteous warfare, and it is God's good service to sweep so evil a breed from the face of the earth. What giants? says Sancho. Those thou seest there, answered his master, with the long arms, and some have nearly two leagues long. Uh, Your worship, what we see there are not giants but windmills, and what seem to be their arms are the sails that turn by the wind and make the millstone go. Oh, it's easy to see, replied Don Quixote, that thou art not used to this business of adventure. Those are giants. And if thou art afraid, away with thee out of this, and betake thyself to prayer, while I engage them in fierce and unequal combat. Here you can see one world giving way to another. Uh, Sancho it was more in our modern world, the world of surfaces, and just simply couldn't see what Don Quixote could see. Uh, from our point of view, Don Quixote would be uh, called delusional. But a a much more phenomenological view is that he still lived in the world that was shared by Merlin and way back through Parmenides, a world where the surface of reality and the background of reality were not so far apart. One interpenetrated with the other quite easily, and uh, at some point in our history they they were coextensive. Uh, The natural world was the divine world. Uh, as a separation <coughs> began to occur, uh, their differences could be felt, and this book just shows brilliantly how uh, the world in which they were transparent to one another gradually drew to a close. And now, uh, particularly since the 19th century, a actual breach between the two has occurred, and now we just gaze upon a world of surface only. We don't normally see... Uh, the the phenomenal world transparently reveal to us the background of reality at all. So far then, I've given you a picture or a conception of reality uh, that shows reality to have a surface aspect, which we normally call the world of the senses or the phenomenal world, and a background aspect to reality, which we are normally 
uh, unaware of altogether. And I also gave you some examples, one from my own life and one out of literature of past times, which shows the relationship between the surface of reality and the background of reality and how they can appear in relation to each other. Now, I want to give you a picture uh, of this that comes from the 19th century. Here it is. And it comes out of a book from, from Camille Flammarion's L'Atmosphere. And as you can see, the surface aspect of reality or the phenomenal world, the sky, the earth, the tree in the middle and the sun and so on, is being penetrated by a figure in the left who is now entering the background aspect of reality, penetrating the surface, as it were. It's a very, very clear picture uh, of that process. And you can see from the diagram that the artist has difficulty in showing us what the background reality is all about. The, the symbols there are difficult to, do, to decipher or it's not meant to be another aspect of the phenomenal world. It's the background to the phenomenal world and as such uh, is very difficult to represent because as soon as you represent it, you're back into the phenomenal world. Nonetheless, it's, it's a time-honoured um, journey, the journey of the initiate or the visionary to go in some sense beyond the phenomenal world to the background of reality. And this conception is very, very important to us in discuss, discussing the new genre of literature today. Now those who do go through, some of them don't make it back and sometimes we call that madness. They just uh, encounter aspects of reality behind the veil, as it were, that they cannot successfully bring back. But those who do bring it back uh, bring us a fresh new meaning that now has to be clothed in a, usually an artistic form. It could be a word, a new word, new language or poetry, or it could be uh, a... Uh, art or sculpture or an architectural form or a new cultural form. Uh, so uh, the, in this way these initiates bring back new meaning and, and put it into a form so that when we look at the form, if we have symbolic eyes you might say, the eyes to see symbolically, we can begin to discern the new meaning uh, as represented by the form. So the new meaning is now in phenomenal reality, but as background. And so, after a time, that new meaning coagulates, and uh, we have new cultural forms, and eventually we end up living in a new world, a different world from what obtained before the initiate went there and brought back some fresh meaning. Now, the other thing to notice is, in the Merlin example and Don Quixote, uh, their entry into the background of reality was relatively easy. Uh, Merlin simply had to lie back and surrender. And th this goes back at least to the time of Parmenides with his method of meditation where the idea is just to surrender, collapse, let go, and then the background to reality uh, reveals itself. And uh, as with Parmenides, uh, one can come back with uh, new laws or some, some new meaning that can advance culture. The general direction being from simplicity to complexity. And as you know, our present state of consciousness and our present world is vastly more complex than what it ever has been in the past. That's the general process of the transformation of consciousness and world. Today, however, matters are very, very different. Uh, over time, it seems that uh, our consciousness and the world uh, have become relatively stable and so solid, you might say. We call that today positivism or empirical reality, where we experience the world as being surface only. It's no longer transparent to that background as it was, say, in Don Quixote's time. As such, uh, the background to reality is separated by an abyss or a gulf from the surface, which is no longer transparent or porous to it. Uh, 
And so for the modern day initiate to break through into background, the background reality involves dangers and complexities that did not exist uh, prior to, say, the 19th century, when the uh, connection between surface and background was severed and producing our present culture. So I'll be now talking to you about two moderns, individuals, who did break through to the background of our modern reality and what they discovered there and the unique difficulties and complexities involved in bringing fresh new meaning back to our world, uh, thereby changing it. So that'll be our next step.